या गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर वालन यस गुड मॉर्निंग या वी आर ऑलरेडी स्टार्टिंग इज ऑल इज दैट ओके या या इज फाइन फाइन वी कैन स्टार्ट As I said, this kind of material structures are becoming increasingly more important in today's technology. The reasons are multiple. They can give some different specific performances. Of course, due to the volume of material, they appear to be cheaper in that sense. And we are also developing techniques to process them which are enabling us to do that on the on the large scale with uh, uh, less costs so for that reason i would like to review the application of thin films and then also some some structure and microstructural features uh, that we can uh, uh, meet during the studies of these films. So what we're going to talk about today. First, there are some specific, very specific terminology in the thin film technology. So we will uh, define what thin films are and what are all this uh, terminology uh, related to the thin films. So we will, we will uh, review the applications. So we will see where do we find the thin films and then how are they made i think i'm gonna focus on that quite a lot so about the processing technology then some physical and chemical description of the thin films and what how what we have to look in when we are discussing thin film structure and properties so what is the thin film science really and if we're going to have time, I will spend a couple of minutes to, well, to discuss with you what is the future of this technology. So what the thin film is. So it's a thin material layer. The thickness is arbitrary, but normally we consider thin films up to several micrometers. Above that, we are talking about thick films. And the difference between them is in main, in main way, it is how they're processed, how they're produced. We will see how we are producing thin films. Well, we're not gonna talk so much about thick films, but thick films are normally produced with something called uh, tape casting. So we prepare a slurry of the, some ceramic powder and we cast this, this slurry thinly, we cast them on the on the foil. However, these are thick films, and we're gonna talk about thin films today. So, as I said, there's there are layers of material with a thickness of up to several micrometers. And very importantly, this layer resides on a substrate. If there's no substrate, we are we can talk about foils but uh, uh, thin films are produced on a substrate. What the substrate can be, it can be a very different material. It can be single, single crystal or plastic uh, substrate or glass substrate and so on. As I said, there are some economical but, but mainly also technological interest in thin films. It's not only the price, but it's only it's also the new interesting properties and functionalities that we can really obtain with thin films. But of course, there are also problems. The problem is the processing technology, which is difficult to adjust to the mass production and still to obtain very high precision and uh, high thin film structures. 
but we are progressively improving this technology and today um, that problem is disappearing. So how, what thin films can be? So it, they, the thin films can be very dense, can be like a single crystal layers, but we can also produce highly porous films. So it depends what kind of material, what, what kind of processing method we use. Normally the thin films are under stress. So either compressive or tensile stress. We will talk about that. And this stress depends on, on matching the structural patterns of the film with the structural patterns of the substrate. The film would have also very different defect structure and different def defect concentration compared to bulk. And that's all because of a different processing method and different stress and strain conditions in the film. If they are very thin, we can consider them as a quasi two-dimensional nanostructures. And in that sense, you know, we can invoke some, some quantum effects in the thin films. And there's another thing, the predominant feature or the feature of the film is surface. Now, we have much higher ratio surface to the bulk in the film than in ceramics, for instance. So we have to think here about the surface science, about the surface chemistry and surface physics. All of that, what I'm telling you, changes all kinds of functional properties that we have taught so far, from electrical, magnetic, optical, thermal, as well as mechanical properties. There's another nice thing about the uh, tin films. Well, you know, we can deposit one sort of the tin film and on the top of that also another and yet another. So we can have kind of composite thin film structures and that can bring out a number of new interesting properties. So where do we find tin films? Well, I would say almost everywhere. I have listed some of applications here, some of fields of applications, but really this is becoming predominant, almost I can say predominant use of advanced functional materials. You cannot even imagine uh, now technology without in films. All the electronic technology, uh, advanced optical technologies, uh, advanced green, sustainable green technology, sensors, everything contains thin films. I'm going to lead you through some of these applications just for you to understand the importance of, of this kind of technology. First of all, solar cells. A normal photovoltaic system, solar cells, flexible solar cells, where the thin films are deposited on polymers or on the amorphous silicon. You know, it's not only one thin film, actually it's a structure of different thin films as it's shown here, uh, that makes then the photovoltaic cell, cell to function uh, with, with some reasonable efficiency. Of course, in electronic, and here I give you an example of flexible electronic, but not only that, you will later see that, that it is present everywhere. The thin films can also be very useful because we can produce them so thin, like a couple of nanometers thin. They can be used as a diffusion barrier. For instance, if we would have a substrate and then some thin film which wouldn't be chemically compatible. We can apply a barrier film that would prevent diffusion of one material into another. And that is very often done. And for this purpose, the thin films are very, very useful. Then we have protective coatings for cutting tools, for instance. 
and we can deposit with something called physical vapor deposition. We will talk about that later a lot. We can deposit all kinds of hard ceramic coatings on the tools. And that significantly, significantly improves the performance of the tools. Normally cutting drilling tools are, are coated. So you, I, I have listed for you some of, of these materials that we coat the tools with. And these are mainly carbides, nitrides, uh, that really are hard materials with a, with a strong hardness. So you see now a complex sensor. It is again not just one thin film, but is a structure of thin films. And I'm sure your professor, uh, who is an expert in sensors, will be able to tell much more to you than I can do. Then we have, of course, we have uh, storage, uh, data storage media. Again, this is, this is a complex structure of different thin films, which then would be able, the, the structure is able to accept the magnetic signal and store it for some, some, some time. And also it is enabled then to deliver this a signal to the reading head. So optical coatings, and that's very important. Even, I mean, more and more important. We have window glasses, you know, that uh, through which the infrared wavelengths are transmitting and hitting up our door, our indoor uh, spaces. Now uh, we can coat. We can coat these glasses with some filters to prevent this. In this case, we will need less cooling of the spaces and like energy consuming. Even more, we can have coatings based on tungsten oxide, for instance, which would react on the infrared radiation and would actually change the color, would become darker, higher the irradiation is darker, the coating will become, and that would be some kind of smart coating, which would, together with increase in infrared radiation, also filter more and more of these wavelengths. So you see here on this micrograph, you can see uh, you can you can see the structure of such coating. For instance, you can see it has got like some kind of uh, polycrystalline structure, elongated crystals growing on the substrate. So here is here is another example of a smart coating based on transition metal, which we can also switch on or off. And this can be done with electricity. So if we don't need a shades on our windows, but we can just switch on our windows and they would become darker because the coating will react on the electric field. And of course, there's, there's just like electronics. Electronics is full of thin films. You see very complex structures, for instance, CMOS or, or uh, MEMS or whatever. Uh, there is there is there are techniques now developed which can produce these complex structures in a cheap and a, a way and a mass production can be done. Some very different kinds of lithography are used for this. One very interesting uh, application of thin films are touch screens. So we have different um, we have different methods how the touch screens work. They can, they can use different kinds of uh, signal, you know, capacitive changes. Uh, we can, with a, the with a change in capacity, we change uh, oscillation or inside, inside, the, 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 inside the system. 
and that would be then uh, detected as the as the as the action. So so we changing we changing the pressure on we, on the thin film, like here down, and then we would by the pressure we would of course deform slightly deform the the system of the thin films. What would then re what would then cause the change in oscillating oscillating properties? Well, the second method is similar, just that we are then uh, detecting waves across the surface. Then it is one working more or less on thermal effect and the other one on change in resistivity. So one or another is inbuilt built into your into your mobile phones. Now we came to an important part of today's talk, and this is how do we make thin films? So in general, I'm going to talk about two technologies. One is called physical vapor deposition, PVD, and another chemical vapor deposition. In the physical vapor deposition, what we do with some physical way, we turn the material from a solid target into the vapor and we deposit this vapor. Well, in the chemical deposition, we are mainly we are mainly degrading one chemical precursor to form a vapor and then we deposit this vapor on the substrate. One or another, they have advantages and and drawbacks. So, for ma mainly for va fa uh, physical vapor deposition, we can use lower temperature, and then we utilize some kind of effects in order to get the material from solid state to gas uh, state. Well, we you we work in a vacuum chamber. And we are restricted a little bit with the dimensions of the substrate. It's not very flexible in the term of how we can upscale such technology. While chemical vapor deposition needs high temperature because we need to decompose the precursor. And because of this high temperature, we might have some problems with the compatibility of the film and the substrate. It also works in high in a high vacuum chamber, and if everything in the, is done properly, we get really good adhesion of the film to the substrate. Then is a process which we are not gonna discuss today because we don't have so much time. So called soldier process, and that is very really chemical process. When we use metal organic precursors, we condense this precursor into a gel-like product, and then we thermally decompose this gel-like uh, product to form film on, again, on some substrate. So let me go through some terminology that we're gonna use today. We're gonna talk about plasma. Most probably you know what plasma is, which sometimes we say is the fourth aggregate, uh, aggregate state. But in fact, it's just an ionized gas. Normally, with a low density ionized gas with a lot of free electrons and positive ions that are, of course, because of the presence of discharge carriers, the, the plasma is electrically conductive. Then vapor, it's just a material in gas form. Uh, and it's just because everything has got some vapor pressure and we can increase vapor pressure uh, by different means. You know one which normally we meet every day and that's temperature. But we can use also other uh, parameters or, uh, such, as, such as electric field, magnetic field and so on. Plum. Actually, right is to say plume. It's a, 
it's an area of the material in a vapor phase or in a plasma in, uh, form, which actually is formed during transportation between target and substrate. Well, if we ablate material with a, with a high energy from a solid state, you see kind of plump. Uh, you see, you see a, you see a, a shining area of plasma coming out of the solid, and this this plump contains contains ions of the material that later on are they later on condense on the substrate. Evaporation is just a process uh, to prepare vapor from a liquid. We know what anode and cathode is. We're not going to discuss this. Arc is a high current discharge. Low voltage usually can be also higher voltage, but it's discharge between two electrodes. Vacuum cha chamber. As I said, majority is produced in uh, all the tin films are produced in the vacuum because we don't want the, the atmospheric atoms to disturb the material transport from solid to the substrate, solid target to the substrate. The target is a, is a, is a source of material which we expose to some power, some fields to create initially vapor or plasma and deposit later it on the substrate. And the substrate is a material which we want to coat with a thin film. So how do we make thin films? Thin films are, especially when we're talking about physical vapor deposition, the thin films is, actually we produce by first converting a solid material into vapor and then condensing this vapor on the target substrate. So we have we have several several different techniques to do that but they all pretty much have got the same concept I'm talking about. So again they all these technologies they differ uh, how do we evaporate the material so we can have electron beam physical vapor deposition or sputtering technique or cathodic arc deposition and one very very known is also pulse laser deposition so let's go briefly through these techniques so evapor ev evaporated de decomposition so by let's say by resistive heating of the solid we cause the material to evaporate to go from the solid into the vapor state and then this vapor would cover everything around it around in the system because uh, the the surrounding is colder and the condensation happens. Okay, so that is one way. What do we do with this? For instance, it is very, uh, very good way to, co uh, to coat something with metals. Uh, could be, could be polymers and plastics, or could be, for instance, we use that to coat the samples for electron microscopy with gold in order to become surface conductive it's it's pretty much a simple method especially for smaller samples but also it can be upscaled for bigger for bigger samples and that is used quite a lot in the industry in the plastic industry so the same thing is uh, electron beam pvd so here we are not using the resistive heating, but we are using electron beam to make the material going from solid into the vapor. And the rest, again, is pretty much the same. Also, spotted films are frequently found in the technology. 
especially in the semiconductor industry when, where we are depositing thin films on uh, for production of integrated circuits and it's very uh, common also in optical applications i already said that, that it's also uh, also produced for a plastic you know the plastic we have to for instance our uh, in our cars, there's a lot of plastic covered with metal and uh, that must be mass production because we need a lot of these pieces and and therefore all these uh, all these uh, technologies are nicely already nicely upscaled. So also for the sputtering, we, you know, we can have uh, many different methods how we kick off the atoms from the target into into the uh, vapor phase with this this can be done with a dc current rf radio frequency spattering or magneton spattering but then, again in every case there's the same way uh, same principle we just by one kind of external stimulus we need to to get the atoms out of the of the uh, of the target. So, for instance, magneton sputtering. We are using argon beam to knock out some atoms from the target, and we do knock out charged electrons as well. And the target atoms are also emitted, and then. We using the we are using the electron field in order to keep these closer to the to the target and substrate and not to disperse them all around the chamber. And of course, because the tar, the tar, the target the substrate is colder than the than the target, the material will condense on the tar, on the substrate. Well. As I said, there could be radio frequency sputtering, and all these processes are very similar to each other. So I'm not going to talk separately now about one or another. I want now to stop a little bit with the pulse laser deposition because this is really frequent method. Well, especially in the laboratories, this is this is very nice method for the laboratory. So what do we have? Is again we have a high vacuum chamber and we have a window in the chamber and through the window we are sending a pulse of intensive pulse of laser light onto the target and a blade we really knock out the the atoms out of the out of the target we obtain plume which we said it's kind of you know mixture of ions also atoms but uh, it's high energy, high energy uh, system, and this is the transporting material, material from target to the substrate, where the material condenses a thin film. Now we can choose to warm up the substrate a little bit. Why? to allow a diffusion of the atoms on the surface and with that to get better ordering of the atoms within thin films, less defects, more crystallinity. So here I show you a picture how this plume look like. So you see this plume is extending from the target to, towards the substrate. And it's shining because it's it's a lot of energy in the ions, the lot of excited electrons that emit photons during the relaxation. And here you see the 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 PLD device. It's electronic setup. On the right right hand side, you see in the orange box is the laser, and then we direct the laser light through the system of mirrors into the high vacuum chamber where this process uh, uh, then goes on. 
few words about chemical vapor deposition. Now here, as I said, we are not using uh, the target of the same composition that the substrate we want to produce, but we are using some compound and we vol volatilize our material out of compound by decomposition of the compound. And then it con we have two means. We can de decompose the targeting com uh, compound or the compound decomposes in the contact with the substrate, at which, is, which is at higher temperature. So again, also here we have very, very different methods, uh, but let me just uh, tell you what I mean when I say that we need some kind of precursor compounds. For instance, we are producing a lot of silicon films. And to, to do that, we are not using silicon as the, as the starting material, but we are using silane. So that is compound of silicon and hydrogen. And we decompose the silicon, the silane, and the composition product is silicon, which, which actually then would form the tin film. A similar, if we want to, if we want to deposit nickel on the glass, we are not using nickel as the as the starting material, but we are using nickel carbonyl which then decomposes and one of the, pro of the product is nickel that would then form very nice tin and almost transparent film on the glass windows. The beauty of the CVD is that we really can, can um, coat very large areas uh, if the technology is properly adjusted. So, you know, we are using CVD or to, to prepare some amorphous or microcrystalline films. I already said that silicon is deposited on, on many different substrates for also from, for photovoltaic, photovoltaic purposes or for the electronics. So here is just a scheme of a setup for CVD de deposition. And we have several steps which are common to all variation of this technology. So, so in the step one, we need to have initial reaction between electrons and the vapor that we form ions and radicals. So this is already coming into the, into the activation of the initial uh, source of the material. We need to transport this reactive species uh, towards the substrate. And during the, that process, of course, these species collide with the substrate and can either further de decompose into, into ions that actually we want later to condense, uh, or they can absorb uh, nicely on the substrate. Uh, during the absorption, then the structure is slowly built up. And further than we are, when we are trans transporting more and more of these reactive species onto the substrate, then we are building, incorporating more atoms into, into the initial film and building up the surface that we want to obtain. There's one very sophisticated uh, way of chemical deposition, so-called atomic layer deposition. Here, actually, we can produce, I think for now, the thinnest and the best organized tin films. What we do, we are pulsing uh, vapors into the chamber. We prepare this vapor separately in a, in, in, a, in a source 
and then we are pushing these vapors into the chamber and and for that by that way we can really control the thickness of the uh, film that is depositing on the substrate at every moment we can increase or decrease the pulsing rate so so basically what we can do with this we can build layer by layer we can build a layer of one material if we want and later on the top of it we can build a layer monolayer of another material so we can be very precise well yes this is time consuming it takes time and it's really more or less laboratory scale technology but it gives surprising results because we can basically build artificial materials that normally wouldn't form imagine we build a one monolayer of one particular system and on the top of that something completely different and that then we repeat that so we get something something called artificial unit cells which can really have unusual properties and for scientific research that's extremely interesting method so here you see one example i want to show well it's a scheme but it is scheme it is it is a scheme based on the and the really on the real structure that was done by atomic layer deposition so you see it has got like this pure periodic stacking of few layers of one material on the top of the other materials all can be nicely crystalline and but the synthesis takes quite a lot of times for sure Well, yeah, we can use that for different, different methods. And I have already talked about them because we are running out of time. I'm going to better skip a few things and, and tell you something which is more important now. So there are, very, there are some common uh, microscopical or let's say atomistic sequences uh, uh, for uh, uh, how the films are growing on the substrate. So as you might have already now uh, remember, we are first having some materials which is is transported towards the substrate. So we are impinging the material to the substrate. Then we have to absorb absorb this material on the strap on the on the on the substrate. Of course, the, there is always some kind of adsorption, desorption, equilibrium. So we have some, some species also to desorb. And when we adsorb the, the, the particles, the atoms, the ions on the substrate, that doesn't happen really in the ordered manner. So we have to allow for the surface diffusion that these adsorbed species can this diffuse and form nice crystalline layer. As I said before, there are some properties that are governed by, by the relationship between the crystal structure of the, of the substrate and the crystal structure of the surface. Now I'll give you here an example of of body centered cubic structure and how does it look the surface of su such a material if it is cut in the different crystalline directions so this is the pattern that we see if we look from the top through one zero zero directions one one zero directions or one 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 direction so there are different directions this is one 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 is body diagonal. This is face diag diagonal, and these are faces. So you see, you see, they are very different, and the film will grow on this pattern differently than on this pattern. The strain will be different, so the defect structure will be different, and even the crystallinity will be different. So. You see, the film can be 
oriented in many different ways, so the surface will look completely different. I want to show you this. I want to show you this with this particular uh, picture. Now, now you see. Let's say this is our initial state on the on the left hand side. We deposit film, and there is a matching of of the structural pattern of the substrate and thin film. That's fine. However, what does it what does happen if this match is not perfect? And usually, oh, basically, never is perfect because, well, if, only if you would deposit same film on the same substrate, that would be fine. But normally, we are not doing that. We are depositing film on some substrate with other structure or other uh, stoichiometry. And in all these cases, there would be some mismatch in the structure pattern. So we would get either compressive or tensile strain on the film. And we can really relax this strain. And really, that happens by itself. Or sometimes we need to heat up a little bit the system. And what happens is that we get uh, that a uh, regular, regular pattern on dislocation. Dislocations. The stress is released by formation of dislocations. Well, in one case, they're up. They're from. They're coming from from the substrate up. In other case, they're coming from the film down. So if we look at such interface, we can really see these dislocations kind of line up on the interface. And this is one, what I'm showing you here is one such an example. We see, we have below, you see the pattern of, this, of these atoms below, these white dots, is different than the pattern of the white dots, in, uh, in upper white dots. The pattern is kind of wider in in the uh, in the upper part of the picture. So, and that mismatch is now compensated by formation of dislocations, and we see very periodic periodic line of these in, uh, dislocations on the uh, interface. So. How actually the film grows from the start on? We have two major mechanisms, mechanisms, and one which is kind of mixed growth. So one is so-called island growth. So the substrate, the film does not grow as a monolayer and covers all the substrate, but it forms islands. And the reason to form the islands, and that is quite often, very often, I would say in majority cases. The, the reason for that is that the atoms are more strongly bound to each other's atoms of the film than to the substrate. So by coming up in the islands, actually this is the low energy state. And only when islands are big enough, they start to cover entire, entire substrate. Now, if there is other way around, if the atoms are more strongly bound to the substrate, then they will form layer by layer, layer growth. They will first cover all the substrate, and then the second layer will start, will, will start to grow. But if there is something in between, you see, then we can also get so-called mixed growth when we grow layer, but then we start to grow to grow also the islands. So we know all that is important to understand what kind of morphology of the thin films we can grow. And when we start producing first thin films on unknown compound or new compound, we have to understand what mechanism of growth of growth we can we can achieve. Normally, we have little, very little control over this, and we have to take it as it is. Okay. Now, I would just briefly say that I mean it's it's really 
we don't need to talk how important this technology is for future markets. Batteries, electronics, everything. I mean, all these numbers here are changing every day. We are, we are just like, we are just making this market more and more important and bigger and bigger. So I don't think I, I need to talk much about it because it, it is so obvious. Uh, we, are, we are here talking about new technologies that are coming up, like, like PV panels, uh, all new kind of electronics. Uh, oof, everything is, is uh, moving to the thin films. I'll just tell you one story. My PhD was from microwave ceramics. That was little bulk components, uh, uh, bulk components uh, acting as a resonators within the old mobile phones or old base stations. Now, this industry and well, this knowledge is so obscure now, it doesn't mean anything because everything has dis uh, uh, disappeared. We substituted these components by thin films and, you know, this is what, where technology is going. So, of course, there's some forecasts how much these markets will grow, but I, I don't think I don't think I need to emphasize more how this is important. So, at the moment, I would stop my lecture here because I want to give you some time for some questions if you want to know something from this area. So you're welcome to, to, to give me some questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, participants, uh, if anybody wants to ask question, uh, they can raise their hand or they can just uh, type in the chat box. Thank you, Professor, for this nice explanation and presentation on this thin film technology. I have one small query that when we have this deposit multi-element metal oxide by using RF sputtering system. Sorry, I, have to, I, I just I just can't hear you. I can't hear you, and I can't I can't understand what 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 are you talking. I am just asking a question for deposition of multi-element oxide where we have more than one element in metal oxide form. So there we face a problem of proper stoichiometry. Problem of? Problem of stoichiometric ratio which is not replicated as in targets. Now actually, actually the multi component systems. Uh, so no, there's a lot of techniques for the multi-component systems and we can prepare targets which actually work well fine and we can, when we think, when we start doing one film for which we don't have experience with, of course we have to adjust the conditions of the position. And if we have like, like a multi-component target uh, or we want to deposit multi-component film there could be yes there could be a problem of different excitement of or ablation or or evaporation of the components but we have to spend we have to spend some time to tune this to tune the composition of tar target that will give us the proper stoichiometry in the vapor phase. So yes, it is time consuming at the beginning, but when we go through this homework, you know, we can successfully deposit also multi-component films. Hello? Now the question in a chat box is, is it possible to make thin films of two-dimensional materials? <laughs> well, 
I don't exactly know uh, what you mean with two dimensional materials, but if we deposit normal layer by, let's say, by atomic uh, de uh, deposition, if we deposit monolayer of monolayer mono thin film, this in fact is two dimensional material. If you mean graphene, well, normally we grow graphene uh, in the form of thin films. Uh, that is quite often a more common thing to do. But understand that these techniques are sometimes very sophisticated and we can really produce nice uh, two-dimensional materials uh, which normally we couldn't grow uh, by some other method. Okay, have we got anything more? Yes, Professor, uh, there is one question from Sumit Kumar. Yes. So uh, he is asking uh, when I am, I have grown nanostructures by CVD using some carbonic material like graphene, I perform the reaction at 1050 degree. I found that after reaction, there are black strands deposited in the tube. And it black strand does not remove easily. My question is why this black strand stick in the tube surface while I continuously giving a flow of argon gas? Oh, sorry, I, I don't think I can I, I can I can answer this question because I do have no experience with growing graphene or, or carbon based materials. So, um, unfortunately, I cannot answer this question. So, yeah, there is no more question from participants side. side. So, uh, yeah, Sumit have posted one more question. Which technique is best for thin film growth, CBD or sputtering from device application point of view? Sorry, so I can please repeat. Which technique is best for thin film growth, uh, CVD or sputtering? For implant growth. Yeah, yeah. I, I would certainly say I would certainly say if you if you want to produce high quality, high quality control film, high crystallinity control film, CVD, some of CVD techniques would be much better. Sputtering will give you film fast depending what kind of film you want, but but you can control the growth much better with CVD techniques. Okay, so CVD is more useful if you want to grow in nanostructured kind of... CVD, I mean, CVD is, as I said, gives you much more control over the growth of the film. Sputtering, sputtering is, is fine. Uh, also depends what kind of film, also depends what quality of film you require. Sputtering, I would I would use sputtering if I would need um, I would need a film of where the, 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 the quality of the film, the crystal crystallinity of the film is not an issue, especially for metal, metal uh, uh, films. However, if the film is of more complex structure, CVD is, is much better to use. Okay, thank you, Professor. So I hope we can close the session and we can just after half an hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. And we have research seminar after half an hour. Yes. Yeah, so we will meet again. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, good morning, Professor Valan. Hello, hi, yeah, hi. Good morning, Dr. K. Desai. So today we have our Dean, this one, International Relations, uh, Professor Kosal Desai. Hello. Hello, Dan. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome, Dr. Valen, to IIT Jodhpur in an online mode. We would have loved to see you on campus in physical mode. Maybe one day the world would be normal soon and you would be coming to IIT Jodhpur to see all of us in person. I'm looking forward for that, yeah. It is, it is much better to interact with researchers and students in person. It's, it lacks a lot of uh, things when we are just talking over the, over, over our computers. Yes, yes. That's correct. But I think uh, uh, soon, maybe a year later, I think such problems should not appear. I think the world would become go to normal. Yeah, I, I hope so, really, really. Yeah, yeah also, and for, for, students, yeah, Dr. Mahesh was telling me about your lab and your research purely in experimental materials and all. So for you, it must be very difficult to deal with your students in an online mode, isn't it? It is, yes, because for the last two years we were, we were teaching also our students online. And it, you know how it is, it's never the same. It's never the same. So I think we all, we all need a little bit of more personal interaction. Yes. And hopefully it will return soon. Yeah, it will return soon, yeah. yeah. So I think we can start now. Uh, so yes, yeah. So yeah, I invite uh, Professor Kosal Desai to introduce Professor this one over uh, Valen. Yeah. So Professor Kosal. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for the opportunity. Uh, on behalf of IIT Jodhpur administration and IIT Jodhpur fraternity, I welcome Professor Valan to. IIT Jodhpur for this research seminar on chemistry of topological insulators. Uh, we are happy to host one of the renowned researchers in the world uh, for this wonderful research seminar from which our students and faculty members are going to benefit. So I have been given a tough job to describe uh, uh, a renowned speaker in a few minutes, but I'll try to do some justification as Mahesh requested me to be there. So as a dean, I'm supposed to do that. I'll try to do it to the best of my abilities. Uh, so Professor Valant uh, is a renowned researcher who graduated in 1996 from University of Ljubljana in Slovenia with PhD degree in chemistry. Dr. Valant did his postgraduate research at University of Pennsylvania, USA. And then he continued doing his research at Joseph Stephen Institute in Slovenia. After the brief stint at Joseph, uh, Stephen Institute in Slovenia, Dr. Valant migrated to UK where he worked at London South Bank University and Imperial College London. In 2009, Professor Valant established a material research laboratory at University of Nova Gorica. Today, the laboratory with its more than 5 million euro infrastructure and an annual budget of 1 million euro employs 18 researchers at different levels of seniority, different types of expertise and different nationalities. Within this laboratory, Dr. Valent established a group for theoretical material science, surface science, material chemistry, and electron microscopy center. Dr. Valent's main research interests are materials and technologies for sustainable energy, photocatalysts, topological insulators, electrocaloric materials, as well as other nanostructured materials. Dr. Valant has published more than 180 scientific papers with an H index of about more than 42 and has more than 6,000 citations on his credit. Apart from that, he has also authored 14 patents. IIT Jodhpur is really happy to have Dr. Valant today talking about his research work to our students and our faculties. So on behalf of uh, entire institute fraternity and our director, 
we welcome Dr. Valant on our campus virtually and we I invite him for the wonderful research seminar. Thank you, Dr. Valant. Thank you, Professor Desai, for this, this nice presentation of me and my achievements. I'm really flattered uh, of your uh, presentation. And let me say I'm extremely, extremely happy to, first of all, give this course to your students as well as this research seminar to all of you. As we told before, unfortunately, I can't be there with you. I would love to be, but that can hopefully happen in a, some short time, maybe within a year. So since I have so many things to tell you today, I would like to start my presentation. My presentation actually will start with a bit of presentation of our university and my lab, just that you would get an idea where I do my research. And then I'll move to the core of this seminar that is the presentation of the studies that we have done on the chemistry of the interfaces between metallic layers and the topological insulator. So I'm going to share the screen now. So what I'm showing you is the map of Europe. As, and as you can see, it's quite colorful with a lot of small and a little bit bigger uh, countries. Uh, so I'm gonna you know, pay attention to this little blue dot here. Yeah, sorry, well, this is my little country where actually I'm coming from. So it's a small country, 2 million population, but you know, we are part of a bigger community uh, called European Union. So first, a few words about the university. First of all, what I want to say, our university is not a typical university. It's quite small on educational side, but it's big on the research side. So we call ourselves a research university. We have a strong PhD level and a and very strong research. So we are located in the western part of the country. Uh, very close to Italian border. And in fact, our headquarter is just 50 meters away from the border. But, you know, in European Union borders do not exist anymore, so, so there is no checkpoints there anymore. We, we have this, we, we, we are situated in this beautiful valley, a lot of outdoor activities, a lot of greenery, fruits growing, wines growing, and uh, in fact, grape is growing, but we are producing wine out of it. So it is very nice environment to live here. What I would like to show you here is a publication of European Commission. They were analyzing the output, scientific output of university in Europe. And we were very happy because they put us in the top five with respect to three important criteria. Publications in the top 10%, impact, impact factor of the publications, and citation-based impact measures. So we were we, we were there with very, very renowned universities like Oxford and Cambridge, like EPFL and the ATH in Zurich and so on. So, and we want to continue this way and publish very, uh, very good research in very good journals. And here are our 10 highest impact factor publications from the last year. So I think uh, with the research uh, achievements, we can be happy, but we need to continue on that level. So now this is my laboratory. Uh, actually, the picture is from this year. And as you see, we are sharing the same destiny as the rest of the planet 
regarding the COVID measures. So yes, we are equipped very well. We have a lot of uh, quite expensive equipment in the laboratory from microscopy, spectroscopies, diffract diffractometers, atomic force microscopies, lithography. I, I couldn't even put everything on the slide. Uh, but what we do not have, we are kind of getting access through our collaborators. And that is very important. Our international collaboration is strong and it also helps us to uh, produce uh, state-of-the-art research uh, work. So I would like now to go just briefly through all kinds of research topics that we are involved in. This blue triangle here on the right-hand side actually shows the span of our research, which goes from basic research to also industrial research and development. And I would like to stay, start with the most basic, which is our computational chemistry. Uh, and we have two fields within this. One is actually the, uh, the ab initio calculations, where we are involved in French, majority French and Italian laboratories, and we work for, for uh, some parts of research related to the fusion reactor ITER, which is built in France. Then we also have some work on macromolecules using statistical mechanical descriptions, uh, especially the interaction of macromolecules like DNA with some other uh, components like uh, a graphene using for different kinds of sensors, but also just for theoretical consideration. So now we are moving up a little bit on this triangle, coming to topological insulators. Well, I'm not going to spend much time here now because, because uh, you will hear much about that later. Our major international partners on this are is a synchrotron in Trieste and EPFL in Switzerland with common projects we are, we are investigating defects in uh, these materials. A lot of work is done on electrochemical processes for water splitting, water purification, uh, and similar environmental issues. So here, uh, we are synthetic lab, so we are producing all these nanocomposites by ourselves, and that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the subject of research. So we have now open, this is the new topic in our laboratory. We are studying covalent organic frameworks for the different kinds of applications, either for biosensors or for uh, carbon capturing. Uh, you know, that is another hot issue in environmental research. If we would, if we would be able to efficiently capture, capture carbon dioxide from the gases, uh, uh, then we could resolve a lot of environmental problems. And finally, coming to energy storage technology, we have patented some very interesting uh, technologies, basically chemical cycles uh, for uh, energy storage and production of hydrogen. Now we are producing prototypes and trying to commercialize this issue. At the same time, we are also investigating the chemical and physical fundament fun fundaments of, of these processes. Okay, I think it's enough of the lecture motion. Thanks. So, so we better go to the some proper research work that we have done in the. Well, that is, I think it's four, five years long story, what I'm gonna tell you today. So the major collaborators here, uh, is Sandra Gardonia and Mattia Fanetti. Actually, they are researchers in my group, but initially they were employed, previously they were employed by Synchrotron Trieste, so they are expert in the synchrotron uh, 
techniques. Katja Perfolia is a PhD student who has passed PhD on, and she, she was intensively involved uh, exactly in this topic. So I'd like to spend a few minutes to introduce topological insulators to you. Now here is a kind of picture of a regular semiconductor surface. We know bulk band and conduction band, valence band, and the gain, uh, band gap in between. That is common. But now when we are talking about topolo topological insulator, this simple picture get, gets complicated. Now, in topological insulators, the bulk is semiconductor, and it looks like the one I have shown before. But on the very surface of the semiconductor, there is the C of free electrons. These are free electrons just on the surface of this semiconductor. If we break this semiconductor, this picture will reappear on every surface exposed. And the reason for this uh, are states that actually cross the band gap and form so-called Dirac cone. With a, Dirac, with a Dirac point in the middle. So, well, I try, I use this chocolate bar just to try to illustrate uh, these topological insulators. If we say that the, that the chocolate is semiconductor, you know, we have, we have it wrapped in aluminum foil. So inside we have a semiconductor still, but on, on the surface, the system is conductive. So it has got these so-called topological surface states, which provide free electrons uh, and conductivity. So we have to understand this, that the topological phase, surface states are the result of bulk structure. They are not like surface phenomena, although they appear on the surface. So it means, even if we modify surface uh, to some extent, the states will still be there. Even if we cover this surface with something else, we will still have these states on the interface because they are there due to the bulk structure. Actually, they appear for high depth atoms where there's an intense spin orbit contribution which causes the inversion of states in, in such systems. Now, there are a few interesting properties of these states. They are very linearly dispersed, and that means that the ele ele electrons will have extremely high velocity, like, like, a, like, like, like Dirac fermions in graphene. In addition, the electron flow will be spin polarized and non-magnetic and they do not scatter on non-magnetic centers and polarization in these materials depends on the direction of propagation we can use all these properties for very interesting interesting applications i'll show you just one spin walls we can actually switch magnetization in spin walls with a spin polarized current that we get from the from the topological insulator without applying any magnetic field. So in reality, uh, we produce such a strong spin orbit pole to, 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 to really induce this process. We have a kind of magnetization without the magnet here. Okay, that's all fine. But in, the, in all of these applications, we need to contact the electrodes on the, on the topological insulator. We need to deposit some metal on the surface of, of the topological insulators. And for that reason, we need to know how this metal interacts with the topological inter, uh, um, topological insulator. 
do we have any hybridization between electronic states of the metal and topological surface states? How the spin momentum locking polarization is influenced by this coupling? Do, is, is the contact Schottky or ohmic? And a very important thing, is that, met, is that contact interface stable or it changes with time? Is there any aging of such contact? So, and this particular point is where we focused our research in. So, the modern material for topological insulators is bismuth selenide. So, here I'm showing you the structure of bismuth selenide. Well, you can see it's kind of a layered structure. We have so called printable layers, which together are bound by secondary forces, by Van der Waals force. So, basically, we can easily exfoliate this, we can easily break this electrostatic secondary force and, and kind of Get get layers, flakes of uh, bismuth selenide. It's rhomboedral crystal structure, and if we don't, we so so much that we lose this particular uh, space group or symmetry. Uh, basically, we also destroy the topological character. Another thing with bismuth selenide is that it has quite dense defect structure. Uh, which cause kind of N type doping. So also the bulk is partially conductive, which actually uh, it's spoiling the spoiling the party because we do want to have semiconductor uh, uh, properties within the bulk. And there's now a lot of research on how to eliminate these defects from the bulk. And our latest project that we want actually and we, are, we, we will be performing together with EPFL, is really aiming to reduce the density of the defects in the bulk. However, this is not the topic of our research. The topic is how, the, uh, uh, how these materials interact with metals. Some studies have already been done, but studies have been done on single atom deposition, and it was, it was shown that single atoms can intercalate into the structure of bismuth selenide and deform, strain, locally strain the crystal. But there's no further studies how higher concentration of deposit are interacting with the matrix. Now, we don't know how much of intercalation the structure can withstand and what happens beyond that. So this is our study. Now, we produce our own single crystals using Bridgman method. So you see here the single crystals on left hand side, you see single crystals that we have produced and then kind of, you know, got out of, of, of this uh, ingot. And we analyze these crystals for their purity, their crystal state, uh, using different but basically known method, STM, SCM, lead, and so on. Then we have studied the electronic properties and chemical, chemical physical properties by synchrotron techniques. Mainly for electronic properties, we use angle result photoelectron spectroscopy and for chemical and physical properties x-ray photo emission spectroscopy. The work has been done in synchrotron Trieste. We are quite lucky because synchrotron Trieste is very close to our lab. I don't think it is even 30 kilometers apart. So I will start this story with titanium. We deposit titanium on bismuth selenide. Titanium has been often, often, often used as a diffuse barrier for some other uh, uh, films. <laughs> but, you know, people have noticed some strange behavior. However, they never really analyze what is going on. And you will be surprised now. 
Now, first of all, we deposit titanium on the top of bismuth selenite, and the, the titanium grows in an island growth mode, forming islands of basically B modal distribution uh, with the size of B modal distribution. So then we have analyzed analyze the chemical stability of the islands. So this is now clean bismuth selenite surface where we find, where we have no surprises, we see selenium and bismuth uh, core levels. But then when we deposit titanium and we are analyzing samples with different coverage, we see that this initial pattern is changing very much. So let's have a look in bismuth. You see, you see how the shape of the peaks are changing and new peaks appearing. Also for selenium, it's the same. And the titanium initial, initial, initial uh, peaks are also changing with the coverage. So that certainly shows on some chemical interaction between titanium and bismuth selenide. Now, to understand it, we have, of course, the the convolute, the convolute, the peaks, in order to see what kind of of uh, components are within an uh, envelope, and we have been able to identify for the bismuth levels. We have identified the, the appearance of elementary bismuth peak. Also appearance of titanium selenide peaks and in, in selenium and titanium spectrum. For, for high coverage, that was even more obvious. So metallic bismuth and, and, and some signal from titanium selenide peaks. Uh, with, a, with a high coverage, we even have seen some metallic titanium, which actually is just what we have deposited. But I got even more surprises here. Now remember, all that before has been happening at room temperature. And then we have done deposition at some cryogenic temperature, 130 K. And even at that temperature, that very low temperature, we have seen the traces of chemical interaction. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never seen a solid state reaction at such a low temperature. While you have clear signs of this chemical uh, reaction in the case of titanium bismuth selenide interface. So we've been able to detect this interaction by many means. I'll just show you now here transmission electron microscopy. If we look the cross section between the titanium and bismuth selenide, you will see that in the cross section you have completely different fringes, which is showing on some new composition form, new compound forming. Now if we do the line scan through this, we can clearly see all these processes that we have previously seen with XPS. We can see formation of some selenite phase and then disappearance. We can see increase in bismuth showing, showing that there is some bismuth accumulation. We can also, we can also see a uh, here titanium layer, deposited layer. So there's no doubt that we are talking about a chemical interaction at room temperature and even lower temperature on this interface. Now I will show you something just because it's quite unusual uh, to see this. Now we then we said, okay, but what if we really load a lot of titanium on the bismuth selenide? So we have done high coverage. So you see now picture for low coverage. It's nothing special. Now we, we deposit this titanium which interacts with 
with bismuth selenide, but the surface stays smooth. But now if we increase coverage, we get some interesting, some interesting features. This is now SCM picture of the 40 nanometer nominal coverage. And what you see here, I mean, this is real picture. This is, this is image that we have obtained in uh, SEM. And you see all these ripples, wrinkles on the top of, of the bismuth selenide. I can show this closer. You see, they're really nice and kind of periodic. They are hollow, in fact. You see, so we can actually explain formation of these wrinkles. In fact, it is kind of wrinkling similar to a dry apple or our skin, actually, really. When the surface gets dry and beneath the sur surface, we have some softer media. In our case, this is metallic business software media, and the top is titanium selenide. So the surface start due to the compression uh, uh, strain, it gets wrinkled. Okay, but this is just a curiosity, and I go now on. So we said to ourselves, okay, if titanium reacts with the bismuth selenide interface, let's take something more noble, silver, for instance. So we deposited silver, we waited for some days, and then we have a look of this deposition again. And what we see, oh well, we see the morphology changes very much with temperature, also in the case of silver. So we immediately suspected that again some chemical reaction happens. So we have done a lot of studies on this. I'm not, I don't think I have time really to go into every detail of these studies. We have done some EDX analysis at the time of deposition and after 70 days, and we have seen some changes in, the, in uh, intensity of peaks, but really we haven't seen that the silver peaks would disappear. So some, we concluded that some silver a kind of diffused into the bismuth selenide, but it didn't disappear from this position. Then we have done something very simple, but very efficient. We have produced nanoparticles of silver and nanoparticles of bismuth selenide, and just mix them to together and put on the shelf for 21 days, you see here. And we were X-raying them in between. And we have seen development of the new peaks in the X, XRD, pattern. And we were able even to identify these new peaks. But then, if we have done something similar in the solution, that was even more intensive. And all these peaks really kind of came out nicely for us to identify. So SEM analysis, elemental mapping, show again the presence of bismuth in some areas, so like here, like here, like here. And also we were able to identify uh, phases containing selenium and uh, silver. So based on all this investigation, we've been able to write down the reaction or that happens at room temperature between metallic silver and bismuth selenide. So you see this reaction and see again here, we produce metallic bismuth. We can say then that silver is not really good for ele electric contact, contacting for electrodes because it's just not stable with time. And with time your device will degrade because of this particular reason. Okay, so of course, very logic. Next step is to go for even something, for even something more noble, and that was platinum. So I'm not going going to go in details, but I'm just going to show you the most obvious thing. So here is TM TM image of the interface. You see platinum film beneath is 
bismuth, selenite, substrate. And if you look closer in the interface, you will again see another, another pattern of layers, much narrower. Uh, and this is uh, actually the new phase which appeared on the interface. So it is something like uh, terminally bismuth platinum selenite phase. In the literature, we found that two exist. Uh, for the moment, we haven't identified which actually forms here. And further, of course, here's the gold as an even more noble and inert metal. So we again studied exactly the mechanism of deposition growth of the film. Here we can see it's growing in a nice island manner, uh, which islands which then just getting more dense and form some island structure for the higher coverages. Uh, what we have seen here after some long time that the film is stable. Actually, we haven't seen changes of morphology with time. So even, in, even topological surface states were, sta were stable with respect to the, uh, to the coverage. So at some point at high coverage, of, of course, we don't see them anymore because they are masked by the, by the deposited layer. But the, there's no kind of bank gap opening or disappearance of the Dirac coin. So we can say out of this brief, uh, brief, they are not brief, they were taking us a couple of months, but still initial experiments that the gold film is stable. However, when we check the XPS with coverage and with time, we can see some changes with respect to the to the pure bismuth selenide bulk. Especially in the in the bismuth pattern, we can see development of another bismuth peak here. And we have identified this peak as a metallic bismuth. As a metallic bismuth. We have seen some slight changes even in selenium uh, uh, spectrum, but not so obvious as in bismuth. The gold remained the same. So we can conclude that really the gold doesn't undergo redox reaction with bismuth selenide as the other metals do. It remains in the metallic state, but something happens with bismuth. Now, we believe that bismuth is absorbed into, into the gold layer or, or, well, in some way it diffuses and makes a gold bismuth alloy in the top. Uh, so, we can say that the interface is not completely inert. There is some interaction, but it's minor and hopefully we are able to use gold uh, for electroding topological insulators. So some trends, I can, I, I can put on some trends for the reactivity of different materials. Certainly reactivity is very much dependent on the re uh, standard reduction potential of the metals. So higher it is, less interaction we will see with the bismuth selenide. If the reduction potential is very negative, actually, then we will see very high uh, reactivity. <laughs> like, for instance, in case of titanium, even at cryogenic conditions. And then we ask ourselves, and that is more or less my last slide, we ask ourselves why topological surfaces are so reactive. So, of course, we immediately can blame electrons on the top of the topological, topological insulators, because this is how these materials differ from just 
ordinary semiconductors. So we do have we do have a lot of electrons on the top. It's kind of you know the the, the surface is flooded with electrons, and these electrons can serve as a kind of of mediate, mediator, or we can also say say catalysts, which actually enable transfer of of the electrons which are required for the solid state reaction from bismuth, in that case, to titanium, and then. We need only, only a little bit of ion diffusion to form to form reactive layers, and when the reactive layers is formed, these electrons, of course, sink down to the new interface. I told you that topological surface states cannot be destroyed just by 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 uh, changes on the surface of uh, of the material. They cannot be because they are the consequence of bulk. And for that reason, we have here in the interface again new layer of electrons that can continue this, I can say, catalytically mediated re uh, uh, reaction. Okay, so I would like to thank you for your attention. And with this, I concluding my research seminar. And I'm, I will be happy to answer your questions, really. Yeah, thank you, Professor Wallen. So now I request participants, if they have any question, they can raise their hands. Nipun, can you allow them? Nipun, can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So can you unmute the participants? They can ask this one. Yes, sir. Actually, the the no participant has raised the hand. Okay, Sumit has raised his hand. So I'll unmute him. Yeah, Sumit, you yeah, can Sumit, ask. You can ask. Yes, sir. Sir, my question is: uh, the as we know, topological insulator consists uh, bulk insulator states and surface metal states. So then, uh, question is: how to separate the contribution from bulk state and surface states? Contribution. To contribution what? to what? How to separate the contribution from the bulk states in the the Electronic properties in electronic properties. Now if you if you're talking no, about electronic bottles and the material ones, then when they use when they use um, okay, so it's angle resolve uh, method, uh, we are just probing the surface. These are very surface sensitive techniques. So we are not getting the signal from the bulk at all. We are we are probing surface. I think, and when I say surface, I mean like uh, angstrom, or maybe a few angstroms, not much more than that. Even few angstrom is a lot. So these techniques, uh, uh, like XPS and RPS, are surface sensitive. So we are getting a signal from the surface. So, sir, we can get only signal from uh, surface uh, states. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so we can. So we, we can. can we can also the the bulk, but we are using more like a indirect method, uh, some electrical measurement, transport measurement through the bulk, and so on. But but with the method with the method I was describing, no, we cannot probe the the, the bulk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Yeah, Professor Valen, I have a small question this one. So you have showed this one basically with gold, this one, uh, your uh, uh, material is stable, this one. You have showed this one in that sphere. The bismuth is converting into the metallic, this one, bismuth, B, that BI. So ha have you done, have you checked the electrical properties also? A we can't we can't really check the like dielectric properties you mean like dielectric because because the surface is so conductive we won't measure any dielectric uh, properties but we we are studying electrical properties transport properties yeah, transport, yeah. Yeah. transport yeah. properties we, we actually now are studying transport properties and we want to see whether the elimination of bismuth from the bulk <laughs> influences the density concentration of defects, the, the density of defects in the blood. If that would be so, this could be a good mechanism to reduce the, 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 the defect density. And if we do that, we should see the increase in resistivity of the bulk. And this is what we are doing right now. This is a study which is ongoing, uh, but well, it's not so simple to perform it as it sounds. Yes, yes, that's true, this one. Yeah, but uh, if this one is converting in the metallic bismuth, this one, I think definitely properties will change this one, transport properties. Yes, it, they will change, yes. They will change, but but at the moment, you know, and I'm relating now this to also to the first question. At the moment, we are very interested in the bulk we know that the surface is conductive but we want to make bulk uh, we want to reduce conductivity in the bulk by reducing the defect density hmm. so, so so this is where we are focusing and of course you know to measure the electric properties of the bulk through the uh, the the influence of the of the conductive surface is is uh, tricky yes yeah thank you any other questions from the participants yes sir there is one question from sumit kukreti i'll unmute him yes yeah sumit i have unmuted you you can ask okay yes. okay Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good seminar. Sir, I have a query that uh, as these topological states, surface states are robust, irrespective to the any impurities in the material. So as you have shown that BI to SE3 material, you have explored it experimentally. So have you found uh, the, the similar signature that robustness of this topological state as you uh, showed that there is a possibility of defect in this material? So is it also uh, experimentally realized that uh, that proof that uh, instead of this uh, impurity state, we are getting the enough topological results which are contributing in the conducting state? Yes, 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 of course. It is it is well known, yes. It is well known and experiment, experimentally shown, uh, but not all impurities are not uh, not for all impurities it is robust magnetic impurities uh, are more it is more sensitive for magnetic impurities magnetic impurities can kill topological surface states actually we also investigate topological insulator nanoparticles you see now the, the the research i showed has been done on single crystals and single crystals we can analyze with ARPAS method and identify the Dirac point and confirm their topological insulators. However, if we do nanoparticles, we cannot do that. I have, we have very limited choice of methods to understand, uh, to understand whether these nanoparticles are topological insulators. And another, our research here, we have developed a uh, very nice uh, spectroscopy, e e infrared spectroscopy, well, infrared and visible uh, spectroscopy based method to identify topological insulator states on nanoparticles. 
Why I'm telling this? Because with this method, we were able to follow the follow the uh, degradation of topological surface states after the position of different layers. And actually, we are seeing that is this quite different behavior depending on the chemistry of layers. Okay, sir. thank you. Sir. I request all the participants to ask their query. They can raise their hand or they can post the query in the chat box. Yeah, if no more questions, then I would like to thank Professor Wallen for delivering this excellent talk. So thank you, thank you so much. And with this one, we will close today's session. Thank you for your patience and your uh, and your time. Yeah, thank you. And definitely, students will contact you this one if they need some help. This one, particularly in this area. Of course, area. they're welcome. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Uh, see you in the evening. Yeah. In tutorial. Yeah. Okay.